project is really all about sharing information and giving you some knowledge around collaboration and partnerships and also we've got some industry partners that will share their stories of how they've progressed some collaboration and partnerships in their own regions across Australia. Um, we have uh, Michael Goldsworthy who's going to facilitate the day for us. So, Good morning. My name's Eliza Mitchell. Before I begin, I'd like to pay respects to the traditional owners of the land on which we are meeting today, the Noongar people, elders both past and present. Thank you for attending today's forum. I am the WIN business partner, representing the Community Services and Health Industry Skills Council, of which the eScan video was produced. We produce one of those every 12 months, um, and it's basically to let industry know um, where we're sitting in terms of what workforce requirements we're going to have in the future. And under these reforms, they're changing quite considerably. Today I'm going to talk a little bit about the WIN project. I'm going to talk about what I've discovered in working in this region with small providers and also the tone of why we brought this forum together. The WIN project is funded by the Australian Department of Industry. It's managed by the Community Services and Health Industry Skills Council and it is partnered with the peak bodies AXWA and LASER. The key activities for this project was a $12 million funding from the Department of Industry. 10 million of that is for the WIN project and that is 10 sites around Australia and the site for WA is Southern Perth, Peel, and we have stretched down into Bustleton and Bunbury. The other programs um, is the Aged Care Leadership Project, of which I'm happy to give more information for those that are interested, and also Nursing Pathways, which is being run by the Australian Nursing Federation, and a workforce sustainability project run by United Voice. As we all know, the aged care sector is undergoing significant reform. So we have to look at those challenges and we have to look at the, what those opportunities are for us as aged care providers. It does impact on our skills mix, it impacts on our business models. The aim of the WIN is to increase the capacity of aged care service providers at both the individual enterprise and at the regional level, and that's what I want to talk about today. The regional enterprise level is about looking at different business models, looking at sustainability, and moving forward into the new environment. To date, nearly 200 organisations have undertaken re reform-ready reviews, 21 in this region, 13 of which are small providers. The regions were selected on your demographics, social economics, what the diverse range of clients are, an increasing aged population, we love the sea change, tree change, but do we have the services to ensure that they're supported? As I said, there's a business partner appointed for every region. Today we have three of us in the room. There's Bev Cardoza from South Australia, Lee Vedic from Tasmania, and myself. And our role is to work with individual organisation and regional bodies to ensure that you guys have some knowledge and, and understanding and can grapple the responsibilities of change. The Reform Ready Review was a series of questions in three areas. Preparing for change, workforce, and risk management and sustainability. The results of this region, and nationally, of the questions that were asked in terms of governance, as small providers were scoring pretty well. Our organisation vision and values is pretty good too. Our strategy and direction is a little bit lost. 
hence some of the discussions that we'll be having today. Senior leadership, yep, you've said you've all got it. That's why you're here. Middle management, it's been worked on. Quality systems and processes, it's a tough one. Some of you've got it, some of you need it. And your business development and communication, it's not too bad either. Because you all do have relationships with your communities. And that is gold, absolute gold. Being part of the Industry Skills Council, workforce and workforce planning had to be in the questionnaire. The result is not too many of you have got a workforce plan going forward. But we've got the tools. So don't fear, we've got some answers for you and some resources. In terms of your skills mix, capabilities, yeah, we need to work on those too. Because as the environment changes, so do those needs. And in answering all of your reform ready reviews, you've identified that. Recruitment and retention, that's pretty up there. One of the reasons that we believe that it's a lot higher than the larger metropolitan based organisations is because you are the employers in your communities. So you have a captive audience. Learning and development's not too bad either. But it'll change unless you change your workforce plan. Because you won't know what to identify for people to be learning and developing in unless you understand where your strategy and direction's going and you've got a workforce plan to back that up. Your culture's good. We like your culture. This is a bit of a problem. Risk management, financial sustainability. Big red 44%. You all sort of said, we don't know. We're not sure. We need some help. Great. Again, we'll do that for you today. We'll put you in front of people that will have some ideas about that, that have some directions that they'd like you to consider in terms of looking at your sustainability. Today we're talking about partnerships and collaboration. One of the main areas that I was tasked to look at partnerships and collaboration was in my regional projects. We put two in this area. One is today's forum, which we know will continue to have a contributing factor across this region for small providers. The other regional project that we put in place is a new entrance program which attracts new workers to the industry and provides them with a three-week pre-vocational program that enables them to really determine whether they want to stay as workers within this industry before you as an employer take the plunge with them and before they as individuals take the plunge within this industry. We have 12 employers and we have room for many, many more that have collaborated across three sites so far. These three sites were chosen because that's where the employers were sitting. So, of course, there's availability in other regions and other community places. We look at Bunbury Bustleton at the moment as probably our next pilot site. So there's a, a few steps. Basically, it's to expose yourselves as employers and community providers in an open forum to job seekers and community people alike. It's advertised in the newspaper as an information session around the carers that are in your community, the community care and aged care residential. People come to those forums and they hear from care workers, employers, and people who have made their way in a career pathway through the care industry. They then decide, will I stay? Is this something I'm genuinely interested in? Maybe I could volunteer. We take them to. Not just employment, this is about everybody getting involved in your community care associations. Then they go on a little two-week pre-job 
LLNN if they need it, or they go straight into the pre-voc program, pre-vocational program, which is three weeks with an RTO. They look after the training of an initial three units and they also put them into the employer's placement for a mentor. In fact, Donna Leckie accepted four into Coolabar this morning. And so they'll be there today checking out what it's like to be involved in the care environment. Let's hope all four come back next week for their second week of training. But out of that process of three sites and 12 employers, we've got 23 new people in the care industry. 23 new traineeships. That's awesome. That's 23 people we didn't have two weeks ago. And that's solving a problem that was identified in the first few months of me being the business partner in this role, and that was a lot of you are working, your rosters are 25 to 40 percent below capacity. You need people. So this regional project is bringing those to you. And then we come to today. Today was born out of sitting with, as I said, 13 small providers, which doesn't sound like a lot, but you sort of start to get a trend when you're speaking to them about what they'd really like to see happen, but they don't really know how to start those conversations. They don't really know how to look at how can we do this better? How, who's doing what down the road that we can grab onto, partner with, collaborate with, make sure we're sustainable in this industry? So here we are. Ira Moody, lead agent, Quamby Park, said, yeah, all right, I'll take that on. Reference group from WIN said, yeah, let's do that. That's a good idea. It's a start. Today is a start. It's bringing you guys together to start the conversations, to give you some ideas, some strategies, some understanding that it can work. Collaborations can work. 12 employers, 23 trainees, one collaboration. There's tons of them out there. And I've brought three people today to show you some really good collaborations. New South Wales, South Australia, Tasmania. They're going to speak to you today about how they do it, how they did it, and how successful it is, warts and all. It's not easy, but it's worthwhile. So let's start with some questions. What is your client base? What are their needs and wants now and into the future? Who else in the community provides those services? Have you thought about what relationships you have with local businesses and community service organisations in your area? And what might that mean? What opportunities might there be? You don't have to be all things to all people. You can be good at what you're good at, and they can be good at what they're good at. But you can do it together. Here's some examples of some services that might just be going on in your area. And there might be more than one or two of you doing it. So you're competing. Here's some functions that you might be duplicating in your area. Michael's going to promote and provoke some thoughts, some understanding that it ain't scary. It's an opportunity. And today, I'd like you all to open your minds, have a think about where you'd like to be sitting for your clients in the future. That's what today's about, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. Can't hear? Well, not really. Is that any better? Yes. Yeah. I've turned the volume up a bit more. All right. How do we ensure that current and future clients, residents can access high quality, innovative, individually responsive services? and particularly on the future. Because let's be realistic, we'll talk about it later today, but we've really got three groups of clients slash residents. Existing ones, transitory ones, and those we want to attract and retain later on. So the client question. Number two, 
How do we ensure that our organisations are viable, sustainable, profitable? I openly use the word profitable. We need to make a buck. Why? Because we've got to be able to fund that future. If we can't fund our own future, we might as well pack up. So there's an organisational issue. And the third one is, how do we ensure that our organisations continue to contribute to the economic development, community or slash service development, and the regional development of our towns or communities? In some little towns, regions, whatever, you in fact may, might be the most major employer. You know, take you out, and it actually probably, honestly, it takes the butcher out and somebody else out, because you're sort of the major customer at the end of the day. And sometimes we don't, as boards, think about that regional development, community development, economic development framework. It's a wider thing than just our service or our organisation. So three big questions and three big themes that we'll sort of keep coming back to today. Client themes, the organisational theme, and the sort of wider regional development, economic development, community development theme as well. I've got a very good microphone. That's okay. I just want to know then, um, I'm interested in why, obviously it's government that's allowing these larger firms in from overseas, and why are they doing it when small organisations such as ours are doing such a really good job, and we're being forced to um, change our ways. To compete. Uh, yes, to compete, and sometimes it's at the client's expense. It's not fair to the clients, because bigger organisations Think in numbers, not people. Super quick answer. Um, it's a free market. Anyone can compete. And in fact, there's national competition policy which says by law, as long as you're you know, supposedly legal and all the rest, uh, anyone can be in, the, in, the, in competing, whether it's for mining or food or whatever, or age again. So that's the reality. It's not, we're just sacrosanct, sacrosanct, not for profit. Yes, go for it. I'd like to leave today with some ideas about addressing legal frameworks that enable us to form partnerships and collaborations because that's one of the biggest stumbling blocks that I think I've come across um, in protecting our own identities and our own patch, so to speak, but also being collaborative but protecting us and being able to deal with the government bodies that doesn't inconvenience everybody and we don't put another layer of administration in there. I'd like to go away with some ideas on that. Yeah, okay, excellent. So sort of legal frameworks, um, governance arrangements, structures, etc. So joint ventures, partnership agreements, you know, etc. Yep, okay. Yeah. Another one? Yeah, sorry, thank you. Mine builds on that. Um, I'm really interested in what sort of strategies we can implement to have board-to-board -board conversations. So how can you get boards to talk? A really crucial one, you know, because really, hopefully today, we'll put a lot of effort in today into essentially, honestly, strategic thinking, strategic discussion, to which you can then go away with your board, etc., and make potentially some similar conversations, but ultimately make strategic decisions. Put it bluntly, you guys have got to learn to seriously fly in the helicopter. Too many non-profit boards push the lawnmower and actually talk about the grass clippings. Can you imagine talking about grass clippings? For goodness sake. So, we need to fly in the helicopter as a group and in your boardroom, but we can definitely talk about that because strategy is at the main of the boardroom. It is. Where are we? Where are we going? Any other quick closing comments, requirements, expectations for today? Sets the scene nicely, I think, for a range of discussions. An interesting range of discussions. All right. Um, let's have a think. Um, you might like to grab your pens. And let's just pretend for a minute, in all honesty, that you actually own your organisation. Just pretend you own it yourself. It's yours. You're a sole shareholder. And the board are just friends or mates, whatever, to sort of help you out. But it's your business. That means your bank account, your money, your risk, your opportunity, your everything. So if you own, if you own your place and you are absolutely honest 
absolutely honest with yourself, what's the one, two, or three things you would really seriously do? Let's have a think about, as a group, the really big forces or trends that we see, whether it's across your region, your town, WA, or in fact Australia, what are the really big, serious key drivers, trends, that are, that are creating, forcing, whatever words you want to use, essentially change? Because that's what's happening to us. We're moving from here up to here. But we need them. Standards are minimum. The government never writes standards to maximum. They're minimum. I'm not decrying all the good work you've done and all those damn policy procedures and all the stuff training. Don't get me wrong on this. But let's be honest. Standards are minimum. Everybody makes them. Otherwise, you can't operate. And they're absolutely of no competitive advantage. Well, you're not meant to drive on the road, are you? <laughs> There's consequences. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that's something to think about because perhaps we, and you might already be here on this journey, but are we in a compliance quality mode or have we seriously started thinking about a, a business excellence journey or a service excellence journey beyond the compliance, beyond the quality mentality and approach? We would have to put in competition. You might not like these words that I'm about to say, but in all honesty, whether it's Disability, mental health, aged care, hospital and health, education, childcare, etc., etc., all those human service areas from the reforms, what is government actually honestly doing? <coughs> Privatising, commercialising, corporatising. That's honestly what they're doing. There's still a place for non profits, a really important place, so don't be scared by those words. But that's the truth and reality. That's why we're in going to a free market. We're moving out of a welfare funded, government funded paradigm to our business or community or market paradigm. Now you're, you might philosophically not agree with all that, I'm not you know, here to argue with on that level, but that's the truth of what's actually happening. There was no such thing as retirement before the Second World War. There was no such thing as super funds. There was no such thing as government funding. It was a philanthropic charitable model. Rich people help poor people via either churches or you know whatever. And then we went, then we went into this big welfare paradigm in the, up to about the 90s. And it wasn't Jeff Kennett, it was actually worldwide. But um, the fact was we started moving into a, into a market approach. For, for better or worse, I'm not arguing the case. But there is, I think there's still a very strong position there for non-profits, but for that's for the non-profits like yourselves who are here thinking about the future, planning for the future, etc. Sure. Sure. That is, uh, really, as was uh, on the introduction that Eliza gave, was really about the new service and business models, wasn't it? Absolutely. But there's no question that the, the competition is ramping up. And if you look in the cities, that's more, obviously, more competitive. Whereas the further you go out into the bush, you know, get to Indominka or, I don't know, wherever, or somewhere up far north for you guys, then the reality is probably, let's be honest, there'll be minimal to no competition. It might be a bit, pretty unlikely. In fact, you'd probably be lucky to have a, still have a bit of block funding or something. Why? Because the government says, well, we know our 3,000 k's here or 1,000 k's there it really services don't stack, so here's a, you know, how do we keep it going? So there's some reality about that intensity of competition. Here's an interesting thought. Now this is the employment world, and this is other similar human services around the Commonwealth Government, not your state government. Remember that services are going over to the Commonwealth. Think of a bell curve, and here's Providers. Here's, no one knows whether it's 4,000 or 5,000 or whatever the numbers are of community care, Meals on Wheelsies, Hackies and all that, you know, the whole box of dots. You'll move to Commonwealth and there's a sort of an entry phase. And then that moves over time, not overnight, into a qualifying phase. And that moves over time into preferred providers. That's well known in how the Commonwealth works. In other words, if you look at the um, Sochi um, Olympic Games at the moment, 
of course, you know, wonderful to see everyone doing all their things, but eventually only X, Y, Z people come up with gold, bronze, silver, whatever, the medals. So let's have a think about, if we go to the next page, uh, we'll jump to the next one. There were, some of you remember, if you wind your clocks back, 700 plus skill shares. Remember those things called skill shares? Few, few people are modding. And then it jumped, without going through all the detail, jumped to 300 providers. It jumped to 200 providers. And now, Dave, what's the number? 82. 82, I've got it wrong. 82 providers left, spending $6.4 billion every three years. Have a quick look at the figures, and some of those are even here out of date. This one has dropped to 141. <coughs> Have a look at Resi. Resi at its peak was at about nearly 3,000 providers. It's currently sitting at about 1,100 providers, like you, who will run about 2,800 odd facilities. And have a look at community care in all its forms put together, down the bottom. So what do we observe when we look at all that? What do we actually see when we see those figures? What are we observing? What's actually happening? What's happening there, Anna? Going down, consolidation, yeah. What else is probably happening? Uh, there's probably mergers or melt, yeah, that's be part of it, yeah. What else would be happening? Yes, yeah. Fewer providers, yeah. Also, do you think honestly that Liberal, Labor, Blue or Green, Pink, whatever colour you vote for, has actually made a real difference really? Really, honestly? Probably not. Probably not. But what's the good news when you look at this? Here we are today. What's the good news? Stand up, everybody. Stand up, quick. What's the good news? We are still here. Come on, what do we say? We are still here. And so consequently, we've got to get ourselves organised as, as the scene's been set today. Let's just leave that, those figures. That's just one demo. I could go through the disability employment, I could go through childcare and all the others. And all I'm saying is, perhaps, the other human service areas, there's parallel trends. So we're not in isolation. It's not just, you know, it's not a victim mentality. It's not happening to us. It's happening across human services across Australia. So uh, that's just something we say, OK, that's what it is. Don't panic. How do we move forward in a positive way? OK, if these are some of the big decisions, the big discussion points, the big sort of background informative sort of things, what do we think actually might be the real points we've got to bring up in that boardroom? What are the really tough questions, maybe even the uncomfortable questions, dare I say, that we, we should be asking in the boardroom? Yeah, we, can we take a, a little... What, what's the first one, Dave? Survivability. Survivability. What do you mean by that? Sustainability. Sustainability, viability. The money. I know that's you know, the money, you know. Nonprofits, we often don't want to talk about that too much. We're on about the care. But the reality is we probably honestly need to ask some hard questions about not just where the money is today, but past, present and future. So we need to get serious about that. Pete, you talk a lot about true cost. Do you want to mention something there for a minute? True cost, margin, price and financial planning? Certainly in the future, um a lot of emphasis now being placed on uh, unit cost. Uh, I'll challenge us all to think we should be talking now about what price are we going to charge for our product? What margins do we want to uh, come up with? We need to know our, we need to know our cost, but cost uh, is only the starting point. What's our selling price? What margins do we want? How are we going to package our services to get improved margin um, continually? Uh, as we go along this journey. And without getting too technical for the non-financial, it really, to cut it to the basics, is what is it costing to run the services, what money do we need to make, margin or profit, whatever words you want to use, and therefore what price. By not just overall, but by service type and by what we call unit of service. 
you know, for this sort of service it's forty-seven dollars, for that it's forty-nine. I don't know, whatever. How many of you, in all honesty, you don't have to answer this and show your hands, it's okay, but just think about it for a minute. How many of you just run honestly on an annual budget? Because if you do, it's really honestly at one level just a shopping list of the money in, money out, and etc. What we need to know is how, what's the projected profit and loss, what's the projected cash flows out under what, you know, good scenario, bad scenario, um, a middle scenario. That's what we really honestly need to do. And that work that Peter's talking about is one of the big questions and that sort of practical approach to profit and loss and cash flow is crucial so you can see what's going to happen. Go for it. Um, I think as well in the NDIS launch sites or RIS in particular, what they've talked about is do they have enough money in the war chest as an organisation to be sustainable? And secondly, that unit pricing, they, the cost, you know, what they're, what they're receiving at the moment, they're discovering isn't enough yeah. to cover the cost of running their business. So they're digging into their war chests and are finding that really challenging at the moment. Yeah, that is, because if you haven't got enough money in the war chest, in other words, savings, investments, that is actually your money, not bonds, that's not your money, that's a liability in the future, um, not living off your bonds, the interest or retentions and thinking, oh, we're okay, because if the bonds have to be spent for a new building, then the retentions and interest will go down, obviously. So we need to be truthful about what money we've got or not got. Any other quick closing money questions? Question. That's okay. Mine is, sorry, mine's more a strategic intent question <coughs> that, you know, a lot of not-for-profits, you know, mine included, you know, were set up on a need. And then yes. you start going out and going, oh, we better do this and we better do that. And yeah. We better be all things to all people. Yeah. So for me, it's that question in the boardroom about, well, you know, does our mission, is our mission still the same mission, you know? And what is our overall strategic intent in terms of us being there anymore? Do we still need to be there? Or are there other people in the market that are doing this better than us? Yeah. That's a really hard question, but I think they're the, that's a really important question. Yeah. If we think of residential care, as an example, we can use community as well. Really if we think of it, would you agree that we are highly legislated and regulated? Everyone agree on that? And going up? Yep. Feel free to take this model down if you like. Um, uh, would you agree that overall we're highly labour intensive? Agree on that? Yep. Labour intensive. And then we're highly capital intensive. Buildings, land, assets, you know, facilities and all that sort of thing. And that's going up too. We're moving to high care subacute. What's happening? Ultimately the built fabric ultimately will need to change. Lifting, better toileting, access, you know, all that lifting machines, all the rest. So we're highly legislated and regulated, highly labour intensive and highly um, capital intensive. And we live at this point in time on generally speaking on fixed income fixed income over rising cost and if you want to if you're an accountant you could add brackets plus margin squeeze if you're into that sort of thinking as an accountant. Now a couple of other things. If we're true to ourselves, true to ourselves, we probably, we might not be, but we probably are actually technically over-servicing clients or residents, whether in this case residents. We're probably, if we're true to ourselves, honestly, we're probably in some form or other cross-subsidising services. And if we're true to ourselves, in all honesty, there's probably a range of efficiencies or inefficiencies at the moment. Now that I put you there is actually one way of looking at residential aged care and you can interpret that for community. That's the actual business or service model in a global sense that we are working on. Yeah. Now right or wrong, that's the, that's one way of looking at the service or business model at the moment. 
So if you unpack each of those, the legislation, the labour and the capital and the fixed income over rising costs, the inefficiencies, the cross-subsidisation and the over-servicing of clients, there's some interesting debates there, aren't there? It's come in line nicely with David's and a few of the other people's comments. Not, not the, the, the bad stamp on it, it's just that's the truth of what we're in. Look, you're right, and if you look, if anyone benchmarks in, age, in residential aged care, you'll know that the EBITDA returns are anywhere from minus $2,000 a bit up to $25,000 a bit. Yeah. So how could you have an industry which is sits in that model and some people are doing fantastically well and others are just doing so badly? Yeah. And it's really interesting, when you looked at the uh, KPMG report the government did in terms of its reforms, the not the not for profits are doing particularly badly and the for profits are doing particularly well and yet we both live under the same rules. That doesn't make a lot of sense. So that probably invites us in the boardroom with your senior people uh, to have a discussion about in reality what is our current but more importantly what is our future service slash business model. EG. We're probably an orange now, but how do we reinvent into a mango? Could we actually run, in our area, what I'll call in-resident and out-resident services? A bit like in-hospital, you know, in-patients, out-patients, same concept. So if you had enough clinical people, clinical people and all the rest, you could be actually delivering residential services into homes or villages or retirement villages, whatever, but coming out of the resi. You could actually get up an allied health thing over time, not overnight. Um, and actually, if they've got the right allied health team, people, physios, OTs, whatever, they come on a Medicare registered number, Medicare, mm -hmm. deliver the service, click, the dollars come from the sky. Seen a poor doctor today? No. Not normally, not usually. So, there's plenty of options, there's just two about this question of how do we reinvent our service or business model? How do we communicate the vision? So perhaps communication, better planning processes that engage stakeholders, engage staff, engage volunteers, how do we communicate the vision without confusing government's roles? Um, just to reiterate, I think we should, instead of diversifying in our organisations, be specialists in what we do, do what we do best. Yeah. and others will come of other diversification and collaborate together. Yeah. So we might be really good at one thing, apples, pears, oranges, we'll all gather and we'll have a really great fruit shop. Yeah. But let's just make it, see what we do best, what's turned us on, what our best practices are financially and out in the community, yeah. and then collaborate with others who are doing specialist activities elsewhere. Sure. Uh well, yep. Best practice. Yep. What you have is in your organisation, you can identify what your strengths are. Yep. And, and others may not be as strong as you in those areas, but be better at you in others. So what also what reiterating what um, Paul, Mike and Eliza were saying earlier, it's about the baby boomers that are coming. Yeah. They're going to be smart. They're going to want to know exactly or demand what they want. Yeah. And we're going to have to provide for them. And I speak for most of us in this room who are upcoming baby boomers. Yeah. And we're not stupid. We right. know what best practice is and we're going to look for it and pay the dollars that are accordingly yeah. related. Yeah. So. But that, that's a really good point you raised because that also raised the point about, and this is a tough one in the boardroom, in all honesty, about being true to ourselves, isn't it? Mm. Non-profits, this is generalisation, but there's, there's a bit of an interesting behaviour there in the boardroom at times. They, they often walk, not always, but often walk backwards into the future looking at their glorious past the next minute crash and burn, or they fall in love with their own shadow, but the shadow doesn't reflect true form, does it? We're great, we're quality, Michael. We meet the standards, we must be fantastic. How do you know? We are. Oh, really? How's that? Well, we are. Oh, okay. So what I'm saying is we need to have true and honest conversations. And also the challenge you face in the boardroom, let's be real, in that boardroom, there's always one, two, or three dominant voices. Power, politics, personalities. It might be at a low level in your boardroom. 
it might be at a higher level. But let's be true and honest, there's always dominant voices and different skill sets and all the rest. So we need to be mindful in having these conversations that we are true to ourselves, that we look at the shiny side of the mirror, we look at the black side of the mirror and say it's not right or wrong, that's just where we honestly are. And that sort of thinking underpins what's just been said and said by a number of other people too. But people don't often touch on that soft, what I'll call the soft stuff, the power, politics and personalities of every boardroom, of the human dynamic. Dave? Sorry, building on what Nikki said earlier about our mission and purpose, one question that is rarely asked in a boardroom is, is why do we exist, who do we serve, who are our clients, and ergo, who owns the assets? Um, because managers and boards work for clients and the assets are just held in trust. And, and it's interesting, you know, by law, by actual law, under corporations law, if you're a company or incorporated associations law, you know, think about the actual, what the law says and the case law actually says. The boards are there to act in the best interest of the organisation. That's what the law says, that's what the case law says. But act in first and foremost in the best interest of the organisation and secondly in the best interest, not of clients, of all the stakeholders, including clients. That's not denying our vision, mission, purpose and everything else. But there, uh, there's two, I think there's two types of stakeholders. There's internal stakeholders and external. Think internal ones on your org chart. Members, as Dave said, they're the true owners. The direct, the boards, you know, committees, whatever. Um, the CEO, managers, staff, volunteers. You know, people are in the organisation. Then you've got external stakeholders. You know, it might be Doha or, you know, uh, I don't know local government or community or whoever it is. So there'd be two groups. Yeah, go on. About board questions, and I think one of the board questions is, um, how's the board va evaluating its own performance? Which is it? You know, there's a raft of things around that, isn't there? You know, the role, the purpose, the processes, the people. Um, but you know, if you know, if if not-for-profit boards are not actually looking at who makes up the boardroom and asking that question around, well. Do we actually have the people in this room that can help us make these decisions? Then, how do we get them in the room? How do we get them on the board? Yeah, just following on from that, it's not, I don't think, just the skill sets that you have around the board table, but how do you actually know if you're doing the job that you're supposed to? Yeah, good one. So, it's that self evaluation, self reflection, um, and, uh, and sometimes getting some external support like we've just done on our board to actually review the board. Are we doing what we need to be doing? Yeah. Okay. Uh, in the new world of community care, and what really is our core business? Here's one thought. The design, development and delivery of community care services, comma, and in, in an agreed time, remember they're only funded for two hours, to a predetermined standard, and a defined price. Time, standard and price. My goodness, that's my doctor, dentist, solicitor, accountant, management consultant, physio, OT. They charge by time, they work to a standard. They work to a price. Strike. We might be community care consultants. Oh no. Billable hours, utilisation, time sheets. Oh, some of you are already probably moving down that road. So, but defining core business, our reason for being, is absolutely critical because around that, as others have said, you can place the relevant people in the position to need. Yeah. Yeah. I, I suppose um, one of the things as well that I can see that there's very much a movement for and that um, I'm very much, uh, I suppose, big on um, the language that we use within organisations uh, yeah. um, can kind of help direct, I suppose, where we've yeah. been but also where the future is. One of the things I think that sometimes goes against the sector is that we get locked into um, not-for-profit being not-for-profit. 
Um, and there's a big movement at the moment that we're moving towards um, calling not-for-profits com uh, community benefit organisations, because that's generally what those, uh, those providers do. It might be that they have smaller, um, smaller margins or that they're filtering that money that they do make back into the organisation. So I think sometimes language would, needs to be reviewed within the organisation and the perception that, that they have to provide a, uh, a lower unit cost or, or something like that, sure. because it is that they're not-for-profit compared to other people. All right, let's just bring this to a conclusion. There's plenty more we can discuss, a whole raft we can discuss. But I think, in essence, um, we can sort of start summarising what we've started thinking about. Is there, number one, there is a range of key questions to ask or create in that boardroom. Now, that might be difficult for you as a manager or whatever, or, or another board member. It might be the fact that, honestly, you need to have an armchair chat with your chair or other key opinion leaders to get a sense of where they're at and develop a little strategy going forward. Because bringing change, significant change, there's only two types of change, evolutionary change and revolutionary change. And in essence, we can't afford to seriously, honestly, do it evolutionary for too long. In fact, you nearly say it's nearly revolutionary change we're up against. The reason? Because most of you know all the dates for all the reforms, July 2015, you know, set 14, etc., etc., etc. So we've got to make a serious step change from here to there in a defined, relatively defined time frame. New rules, new business models, you know, everything else. So the reality is, how do we drive change in a careful way without blowing people up, without blowing the organisation up, and bring people on board? But step one might be actually getting other key opinion leaders around that boardroom in some sort of guiding coalition to then start saying, okay, now I've got three or four people backing me on this, how do we actually now bring this to the wider board table and the discussion? Now, some of that honestly might be, forget about the boardroom. It might be going down under the, under the tree for a day or something, barbecue, and what I'll call more of an armchair chat. You know, don't have to be just so formal that, you know, all that sort of boardroom stuff. You need to let the environment be conducive to discussion. And it might be a series of discussions. It might be that you've introduced other players as guest speakers. It might be going on tour and you've done your research. But at the end of the day, ultimately, out of that has got to come some realistic strategy. And I suppose my big message in just in closing is that it's not so much about strategy anymore, I think it's actually seriously moved beyond that. It's about what's the most likely industry scenario for us in WA slash Australia slash our region? What's the most likely, honest and likely scenario, or one, two or three scenarios, for our organisation? Key assumptions, key risks, and then out of that, if that scenario is, you think is the most likely, and that's how you want to go forward with your business model and everything else, then what are, in reality, are the three or four or five major practical steps or strategies slash projects we need to put in place. The old strategic planning still has its use, don't get me wrong, but it's probably moved well beyond that now, the old-fashioned SWOT analysis and everything else. All useful tools, don't get me wrong, but it's another, it's a different time now. It's not a time of relative consistency, it's a time of massive, 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 unbelievable change and massive opportunity. Yeah, because we've got risk, but we've also got responsibility to have these discussions as directors or committee members, and we've also uh, also need to seek a reward in terms of our community, our clients, our staff, etc. Now, those three big questions I've popped up there before. Listening to the comments and so on, and, and being a new CEO and a new board, um, and the board is, is very much been a hands-on board in the past for moving to strategic I'm doing a presentation for the next board meeting about heart and head. And one of the issues for not-for-profits is for a lot of heart, not very much head. Which means our head might say we should do something, but our heart says, no, we shouldn't do that. That's not what we're here for. And it's interesting when I analyse the organisation in terms of head and heart, it's about 80% heart and about 20% head. We probably need to be about 50-50. How do we get head and heart connected to go forward? That's what you're saying. That's right. And, and a lot of decisions in the past have been made on a heart, not to head basis. And I think that's the challenge for not-for-profits is how do you balance between the head and the heart.
Okay, let's have a think. We've um, had three excellent presenters who've shared a lot of thoughts. Some will be new, some will be what you know. But they've certainly put their heart into it as well as their head. And uh, they've also opened up to a number of interesting themes and some practical solutions about how their journeys. So who would like to kick off with uh, a, a question to someone first up? Hey, uh, just a question to you on, um, on your business model. Was it a, the same name or was it a, a gauge name that you started developing this business model or was it something you just believed that your community was chasing? And at the end of the day, what, like after 12 or 18 months and it hasn't been successful, what, is there a deconstruction plan or you, you'll barge on? Okay, on, on the first question of perceived need, was there a perceived community need? Um, from a community perspective, I, I suggest uh, no. Uh, the perceived need was um, our requirement to be functioning and, and operating in a, in a world totally different as we know it now. And we felt that we needed to develop an, a totally different structure to the way we've operated in the past. The, the other question, is, is there a way of um, breaking it down should we not be successful? Uh, yes, we've made a, a number of steps in our memorandum of understanding um, around the area of um, who will have um, intellectual uh, ownership um, to name and so forth. Um, and we've established um, purchasing price and priority of um, first, um, yeah, first acceptance of that. But again, that, that's purely within a memorandum of understanding. My concern is with the clients. We are talking from organization perspective, from provider's perspective, government. We're actually not talking about our clients. How are they ready for the change? How are we promoting the change amongst them? How are we going to sell the change to them? Because the pricing will change, type of services will change, quality of the services will change. Uh, it, it's got to go together us and them. We're working for them. We mustn't forget why we're here. Well, at the end of the day, um, two things. Uh, one is at your local level uh, to engage. Uh, I'm just going to draw a picture as I talk because uh, on that issue of clients or residents, quickly, you've got your existing um, clients or residents. You'll have what I'll call transitories, people who come in for an hour or two hours or a bit or stay and don't stay and leave. So you've got these transitory clients or residents, whatever words you want to use. And thirdly, you've got this group around here who are where you need to attract and ultimately retain um, new clients or you know, residents. Um, so you need to adopt your own clearly education information sessions at a local facility or sign whatever level. Um, the flip side to all that is um, that um, Doha, now Department of um, Social Services, um, has a range of information. Most of it, honestly, is on the web. Um, but I think the bigger challenge I foresee, uh, and most of you are well aware of this already, it isn't um, granny or grandpa or whatever who's really getting heavily into all that, filling out the forms and all the blessed stuff that you have to fill out. Um, but the reality is it's the son or daughter or daughter-in-law. I think that 83% of admissions are by the daughter-in-law, so I hope the Doha um, new uh, website uh, in terms of building software, which is around a complete database. And now that half of that database will be used for aged care and the other half will be used for disability. So some of you will know that um, database and will know about that system that's being set up. So you as a provider or the doctor or the um, uh, son-in-law or whatever, etc., will ultimately use technology to enter in to that whole information cycle. So it'll be a technological world and that's going to be, I think, a barrier or a hurdle for some parties because, you know, there's skills and knowledge. So it's going to be up to individual providers, I think, if they really want to get ultimately get high occupancy, new customers and all the rest, remember that's a very dynamic model, then you're really going to need to get out of that local plain English connection level um, to really make it happen. And it's not only a track getting them informed, but, and I'll give you a practical example, it's gone a bit beyond this now, but some of you know Ferris Care, 
they were a tiny, tiny, tiny organisation out of um, Byron Bay, and they were about uh, 12 years ago we were virtually at the point of closing them up, and now they're the most successful, a very, very successful um, organisation. But what did they do? They simply actually got a whole stack of printed pads, referral pads, saw every doctor, paid for the time, put the pads on the desk, and what do you think happened? <laughs> Referrals. So they didn't even have to worry. However, from a commercial point of view, I would suggest, and the challenge should be, your total direct cost should be marked, should have a, a, a margin better than 30% on top of your total direct cost to give you some idea of price and structure. The, the, the other part to that is, well, okay, that gives you your, your margin markup, but in moving forward, um, what is to be our profit margin? You know, uh, your bottom line should be, I believe, better than 5%. Um, 75 10% if you can get it. At the moment, as a hack provider, our bottom line, in theory, is zero. And yet, we, in moving into consumer-directed care, we've got to have a factor for risk. On that point, Mark, you want to jump up just for two seconds and just tell us what you've observed around the entry of the franchise model, just as a quick example of case study. Uh, I investigated a bigger franchise model out from America about two years ago called Right at Home. Uh, you've probably heard of Just Better Care, which is in New South Wales, Prestige Cares in Melbourne, and you've got Home instead, I'm not sure whether they're here in WA. Uh, right. Effectively, you can buy a franchise for $60,000. You and your wife can operate a franchise. You only need 50 clients to make around $100,000 a year for yourself and your wife. So therefore, and the franchise model versus our model, which is the community care organisations, is at 2.30 in the morning, you can ring the franchise and they'll go and see the client. Try and bring one of our care workers at 2.30 in the morning and they're not on. They're going to say, I'm sorry, please bring somebody else. So at the end of the day, if you want to make a margin and you have a good system, and I've perhaps talked to Peter on this, is actually look at franchising your model. Because the future care needs in Australia, I think, are on more than dollars, uh, cookie cutter type system where you've got very personal care being delivered by the owners of the business as opposed to what we have today. But that's, and as I said, that model is growing enormously. Okay, look, if you've got, if you set up a business and say 20, 30 franchises around the country, you're collecting 5% of their turnover automatically. So collectively their turnover is three or four million dollars, then you're collecting 5% of that and not doing very much at all. That's the franchise model, it's the franchise model that McDonald's works on. In fact, 96% of businesses in Australia are small businesses rather than a franchise model. And that's what I think community care will go to in the future because it's, it's the cheapest model we can produce. There are overheads of you working at home with your wife, you know, from an office at home, what's your overheads compared to our overheads in community care? Next to nothing. So what price can they deliver care at? Much reduced than what we can. It's just interesting um, from the panel at the front, the ideas of trying to value out your current organisation. Um, the suggestion of like setting up cafes, garden services, gutter, gutter cleaning um, within your local community is obviously spreading into other businesses that are, have a higher um, uh, margin than what obviously aged care does. Just a concern is, as organisations, if we start to spread out in that direction, we're getting away from our core business. And I can understand um, perhaps spreading um, services that we currently provide within our organisation, but how far out outside of what we currently do should we go, and what is the risk within our community of putting other local businesses, you know, perhaps out of, out of their services? Well, um, I'll answer that from our perspective, and other panel members may have a different perspective. Um, in terms of cafes and so forth, it's about, I guess, firstly, providing 
an exciting a, a, an experience for the family members and residents of our our clients. Um, and then if we can, if that can provide a further service, uh, great. Um, I think that's key. And in terms of any other services around gardening or whatever, we probably wouldn't enter into those services unless it was filling a gap. If there was a need there and nobody else was doing it, we wouldn't necessarily go into competition with with somebody else. Right. So another panel member. Um, I'll just pick up that point. Um, we, we very much examined our, our mission and in reviewing our organisation we, we've come to the conclusion our mission is to provide peace of mind um, and, and our, 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 our customer base is people over the age of 55. Um, our service base is really uh, again for, for elderly people providing a range of services that offers peace of mind to them and or their families. Coming back to uh, the, the lady uh, asked the question later earlier on about um, the true value of what we do and supporting and caring um, for our clients. By way of peace of mind, if I, uh, I'll use this as a value add and again I'll emphasise that to value add to what we do, we have to make a profit first. Then we're in the business of value and adding. And I think then we are in a, in a position to, to differentiate ourselves from a commercial entity where their role is to make a, a, a surplus and, and give it back to the owners or their shareholders. For example, um, one of the things that we're offering is a free trade referral service. Um, how often do you hear about an elderly person who's been abused um, financially by a door knock, um, and somebody, a, a tradesman ripping them off or whatever? So one of the things that we're promoting within Blue Sky Home Solutions is the ability, we have a, now a range of tradesmen that we have vetted, police checked, reference checked, and, and we will refer clients onto them. They don't necessarily will be the cheapest in town, but that plumber, when you see will be there at seven in the morning, will be there at seven in the morning. If the, um, the price is less than $150, he'll give a verbal quote. If it's more than 50, 150, he'll give a written quote. And by the way, after the job is done, two weeks, mate, within two weeks, we will ring our customer, our client, and say, how did it go? Now, that's value add. There'll be no charge to the client, but we want a, um, we want a spotter's fee, for a better word, from the tradesman. If, I, if our organisation ultimately has 2,000 houses on the Central Coast, what sort of value is that to a plumber a white goods repairer and so forth. So I'm not quite sure, I'm, I'm trying to um, you know, just elaborate a little bit further on, on what we're attempting to do with this model. Perhaps uh, another thought is, and, and I know this is in, in rural, regional, remote areas that tend to have more concentration of age here, but it, it is absolutely stunning to go around Australia. I've worked with over 6,000 NFPs now in Australia, 25 years. Um, and you are increasingly finding a wide diversity. Even in this room, David, what do you run? Uh, we've got a, we're the second largest uh, JSA provider in Western Australia. Employment programs? We run yeah, employment programs, uh, mental health, aged and frail, and disability. So whether you're a Blue Care or a Catholic Homes, uh, not Catholic Homes, Catholic um, Silver Chain, now I'm talking 1.5 billion dollars, billion dollars, and 1.3 billion dollars. Health, aged care, community care, and there's lots of examples. It's truly stunning. If we went to Dubbo, RSL, resident care, community care, child care, ILUs. Oh, you go to others. Um, I think of uh, the Sisters of the Holy Spirit up in uh, Sydney. Um, aged care, resi, blah, 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 schools, and child care. And so it really, for many, they've evolved over time into multi-mixed models. And not all, but I've written extensively about there'll either be those who are just a solid cube, you know, I don't know, we do resi and that's it, niche market, boiler, or flip side, they'll be Rubik's cubes. And you think of a Rubik's cube, that each little cube is the service type. 
So if we went to Balan and District, have a look it up sometime, Balan and District Health. They spoke with these guys at the AXATAS conference. Got a paper. They're really a serious Rubik's Cube. You might know them as a multi-service, a multi-purpose centre, MPS NBC. If you don't know those, they're Think Rubik's Cube. So what do they do? They were the first GP super clinic in Australia. Resi care, community care, podiatry, independent living services, retirement village services, acute, and on day surgery, on and on and on it goes. And they've got a one site, one stop shop approach. What have they got? 5,000 people living in the town and they're working hard to get 5,000 members of their organisation. Why? Because when government goes to defund or whatever, 5,000 people walk out the door, you know, politically. So they bring real connection. Glenn Rowbottom is his name. He's well worth getting over some time or having his papers. So but it's not for everybody. I'm not saying it is. But this multi-mix, multi-service model is crucial. And if you have a look at what I've drawn here, uh, I think it was Phil touched on it, Pete did too. Whether in the age game or the 0 to 100 game, Disability, people with disabilities, aged, people with mental health, people with injury, people with accident. If you're in the care game, care, whether it's for the over 65s or 0 to 100, whatever the groupings are, that's the client groups, think of all the money streams, grants, donations, tenders, state government, commonwealth government, Medicare, Doha, NDI, DVA, workers comp, road accident, etc, etc, etc. And then out here you've got all your different service types. All this is, is what you'd see at every country fair, a chocolate wheel. Spin the chocolate wheel for the different client groups. Best example, Australian Home Care Services. Nor to $128 million, standing start in eight years. Does that a whole stack more? Chocolate wheel model. It's a private company, proprietary limited, for profit. Who owns it? MS Society. Why? To fund research for MS. Let's go back to the panel. All right, so panel members, any conclusion, comments, Rachel, got any concluding words of wisdom? Oh, you must. Come on. <laughs> Nothing. Peter? Yep. Oh, I'll give a break just to say something. Come on, Rachel. Um, I think the most important thing to to keep in mind is just to take the punch. It's a scary world out there and uh, it's a changing world, but we um, we need to prepare ourselves. I, I think I'd, I'd echo that. Um, I, I think there's a very clear message. I attended the NDS conference in um, Sydney last weekend and a very clear message, start now. Uh, and the message through that conference was not just through a, a process of continual improvement, but through a process of complete re-engineering our organisations. Yep. Uh, really ditto. Um, exciting but challenging times ahead. Look at all of the opportunities, by all means, but rigorously review. You know, don't go in blind. Be prepared to look at anything, whether that's mergers or partnerships and different business models and businesses you're not currently involved in. Look, go in with an open mind, look at all the possibilities, but rigorously review and make sure that if you are going to do something, you, it, it has been rigorously reviewed and you, you know what you're doing. Um, I suppose be very clear about who your organisation is, where your niche sits, where you want to go into the future and what partnerships and strategies will help you to get to that place. I mean, as Michael alluded to around childcare, um, it's very different from state to state, and I would imagine from region to region. So you can be still here five years, af five years after reform um, when lots of other states have gone to smaller, um, larger organisations. They're pretty well hit every lab, what's happening in the big picture with all the players and who's coming together. Uh, whether it's on the disability front or the aged care front. But uh, some of that would be overwhelming, but when you think about it, what were we originally? Pretty well all of aged care, most of it, not everything, but most of it, came out from communities and from NFPs. And generally speaking, it was a sort of open woodland. Occasional tall tree or shrub, but 
pretty much all the same. And whereas today, we could go to the Cowrie Forest down the road, we could go to the, down the southern Tasmania, or we could go to the big uh, forests in uh, Victoria, and you'll see massive, massive trees. And whether we get massive organisations, or giant trees, large trees, smaller trees, bushes, shrubs, or even fungi, doesn't matter whether you're the big tree or the fungi, there's a place in the forest for you. You've just got to adapt to a forest environment. That's very different from an open woodland, grassland environment. So that's the sort of transition we're making. And if you want to be a fungi, go for it, because in fact fungi can actually spread all over the place so they really get going. <laughs> but the reality is, even a small shrub, as long as they adapt well, as you know here in Western Australia with all your beautiful flowers and everything, you can seriously be there. I think of that as a bit of an analogy. There is a place for everyone in the new world, I think, but it is about that adaption, as all our friends here and colleagues have told us. We're sort of focused today on collaborative partnerships and collaborative arrangements, which at a, at a high level, you can honestly say, really are, put the big word, strategic relationships as a big umbrella. And under that, I've quickly thrown up a few ways to go. We've talked today about partnerships, we've talked about um, collaborative arrangements, which I haven't even written up there, but oh, there's another one, collaborative arrangements. Um, some people have touched on amels or mergers, we haven't touched contract transfers, we haven't touched tr joint ventures, we haven't touched close-ups, we haven't touched takeovers, we haven't touched peak arrangements like the job futures model, we haven't touched back office agreements, service disposals, like you might say, well, in honesty, I'm better to get rid of, I don't know, community care or something and keep a resi or, I don't know, whatever it is. Um, it might be sales, multi-mergers, multi might be mixed models, it might be management agreements, it might be brokerage, uh, etc. So there's a lot of different ways you can undertake some form of strategic relationship as you go forward, rather than just be on your own. Um, so I suppose in setting the scene for all that, I suppose what we're really talking about is at one level, let's get down to tin tax. You can grow your existing businesses, services, normal organic growth. Secondly, you can develop new businesses or services, and we've heard of lots of different things today, uh, different people in the audience that are around, and the panel have spoken about that. Or thirdly, you can take this approach of strategic relationships which might connect the other two I've just mentioned or in fact may open up a whole new front for your growth and development. But in essence, um, some of these strategic relationships, or one of them, might be your way forward. But there are some central questions, we looked at quite a number this morning, um, one of the questions we didn't touch on was um, a true, once again, a true reality test. If you think of all organisations in the world, and EG in this case, non-profits, HQ, you are either honestly in mission mode, growing and developing, expanding, whatever, or relatively speaking, you're in maintenance mode, much the same, much the same, 27 better, 27 better, little pinky tacky things that are happening but nothing much or you're in muddling mode. And the bottom is the word insolvency. You know that cycle. You're part of it. Birth, growth, maturity, decline, death. Organisations are no different from humans. And the organisations are humans. But the fact is, if you think of that cycle, ask yourself, where is our organisation? Are we truly, honestly, in mission mode? Are we in relative maintenance mode or have we fallen into a bit of mission, a bit of maintenance and a bit of muddling? Because either way, even if you, I hope you're not near insults, but if, if things are looking grim, the question is how do we turn around, do the old Keating J curve, and go around and up into a new mission? Or if we're at the crossroads, how do we actually say, whoa, 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 hold on, let's not fall down here or go up there, let's actually take up to a new mission mode. So it's not only about the money, but it's about everything. Your, your intuitive feel when you read the balance sheet, read the service sheet, read the history, read the growth and everything else, you're saying, well, I really know my heart of hearts. Honestly, we are in, essentially in maintenance mode. Or, I don't know, you may be in mission mode, whatever. 
So somehow or other, you've got to turn the face around or you've got to take it up. One strategic plan, next strategic plan, next strategic plan, what is it? Taking the organisation in mission mode. This plan should speak a little bit, not entirely, to the second plan and speak to the third plan. If you went to put all the plans of OzSwim together, 12 years ago they were nearly insolvent, and if you put every plan together, you'd actually see, wow, there's an overlap to the next one. Where's OzSwim today? One board, one CEO, four different state um, offices and services and all the rest, including an aging swim program, disability program. And what have they done? They actually have licensed all their IP into New Zealand, Hong Kong, on it goes. What's that? Dollars dropping out of the sky from license agreements. And 12 years ago, they made better. They'd be a good speaker to get their Gordon Mellons, isn't they? Um, anyway, it's, there's many parallel stories in Asia. Let's move on to this thinking of grow existing services, or products, whatever, and or new services, and or go down this alliance partnership, strategic relationship grow. So there's some thoughts there about that sort of big strategy on growth and or development and with a three-tiered approach. Just before we move into sort of beginning to wrap up, um, a couple of people asked me, oh, it's just coming up. Um, a number of people, in fact, have asked me about Amel Mergers. This presentation is up on my website. Um, but I just want to hit a couple of key points so that people get a feel for what we're talking about um, without getting into too much detail. So, uh, Lee, can you, or someone want to do it, it's still flicking? Now, as it says there, 10 steps to the altar, 23 considerations to secure your marriage. It actually probably won't help you personally, so don't panic too much on that front. But I do draw the analogy between, it doesn't matter whether it's whether a partnership or a joint venture or a mail or a merge or whatever, it is a relational process. And if you think of the old marriage, I know some of us are a bit older and some are much younger, but it, it, I'm thinking the old days, you know, it was a bit of a process, you know, the old courting process, engagement, you know, I know things have changed now, but um, it, it's still a journey. It's still a journey. Well, these days you just text them, I don't know. <laughs> happens, I don't know what happens. Anyway. Photos arrive, Dave, or something, I don't know what happens, everything. But um, you'll find, there's a, on, when you go through this, each, like affiliations, alliances, partnerships, whatever, there's a definition and a diagram to help interpret it. And if we click the next page, then key characteristics, key steps and key results, so you get a bit of a sense of what's an affiliation, what's an alliance, what's a partnership, and blah, blah, blah. So we won't go through those, but we'll just flick over all those. MELBs, no, sorry, just on a MELBs. Typically, it's about organisation A going into B. I've done 232 now for MELBs mergers, nine on the go at the moment, and only a few, the most of them are MELBs, A into B, or vice versa to form A2. We jump on, keep going. Contract transfers, bed license transfers, for example. Um, and a bit of diagram how that works. Contracts, yep, keep going. Partnerships. In partnerships, it's really about a crucial word, ZOMB, Z O M B. How do you create and maintain a zone of mutual benefit? Think about your marriage or your partnership, whatever. If there's not a zone of mutual benefit, and I know it might be really strong in early days or something, a fire and passion are there. Someone's smiling hard there, Don. <laughs> <laughs> and it may or may not wax and wane a bit, but you ultimately do need a zone of mutual benefit to keep, you know, keep it happening. Yeah, that's right. My mother used to say, you never know what goes on behind the sheets. Anyway, now, uh, partnerships, let's move on from there. Joint ventures, you can read about that later. Mergers, now mergers, of all the ones I've done, there's very few true mergers. Usually a merger's about A and B coming together and there's a new company called C. And the honest reason most of those don't happen like that is because it's too costly, you know, and too time 
consuming, just ran through all the power bills over and the suppliers and all, oh, too much. So you find one entity, the, the bigger one, the smaller one with less documentation going in, and you still might change the name or you might keep the two names, you know, Cookaburra Aged Care Homes and Koala, whatever. But the fact is it's a new entity by trading name, but you use one of the existing names, one of the existing legal entities um, to be housed. So what are the typical 10 steps? Um, and there's no right or wrong in this, they, they all vary, but typically some sort of initial discussions, red wine, you know, meetings, CO, boards. It's typically CO led, chair led. There's typically some sort of process toward a, a today you call it a prenuptial agreement in a married sense, but uh, the MOU, which is about, it's typically not a legally binding document. Most are not legally binding. They're um, on, on about what's the overall intent, what's the merger principles, what's the process going to be, what's our rationale, what do we want, what do you want, how we go forward, and, there's an, and some sort of out clauses as well, but it's typically not an actually a legally binding document. If you go forward, there's an available working group, merger working group, of typically those people, what do they produce? They're there to represent the boards, and they typically get up an Melbourne merger plan and they typically do the fight get authorise the or get in place the financial due diligence and legal due diligence reports. Those reports are not about finding skeletons in the cupboard. They're about is this a viable business, is there a business or service case to go forward? Are we compliant? Have we ticked off all the things? Etc. There might be an odd skeleton in the cupboard or something, but the reality is it's really about the veracity of the business or service case to go forward in a money sense, a service sense, a community sense, a you know, structural sense, etc. So those documents, the Melbourne Merger Plan, Legal and Financial Due Diligence, are done. They go to the board, to each board, and that helps inform the boards, make a decision, yes or no. Now the boards aren't the people who can say actually yes or no. It's the members who are the legal owners. Your members are the legal owners. And if you're going down this road, my word of warning to be to make sure you've got a proper members register, who's paid and not paid, up, and you typically your constitutions will say 75% vote by all members is necessary. Of those who attend on the night, generally speaking most, not all, then communicate to the wider world. Why? Because they've agreed to get married. It's no use saying at the front end we're going to get married and never happens. But those who do will often say we're exploring an amalgam merger, we're exploring a partnership approach, whatever the words are, and they put out a whole communication strategy on it. Member cons, because ultimately members have to vote, and even if the directors are the members and members are directors, even if you've got that sort of model, ultimately members need to vote. And it's pretty tough for members because most of them don't get their heads around what in the heck um, this is all about, let alone the industry and all the stuff we've talked about today. So if you need to, when you go to the vote, if it's three meetings, five meetings with your members, whatever's needed, get them fully informed before the vote. Don't let them go to the vote ill-informed. You've spent a fortune of time, effort and energy, and then if they say no, You've had it. I've never had any that say no, but they put huge effort into, from day one, the first thing is to get the members to say yes. So, you know, come from that sort of merger plan and on it goes. And over to Eliza to sort of start wrapping up.